Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Andrew Dalton. I'm the director of the Adams County Historical Society here in Gettysburg. It's great to have, I think, over 200 people already on this video. Please uh, let us know where you're joining from. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and we're excited to be actually on uh, in a very historic setting tonight. Whoop, we got to turn that down. Sorry. <laughs> We're, we've never done this before, so bear with us. And there is a little bit of wind this evening. Um, so we'll try to keep the, the camera close to uh, the, the speaker. And uh, if you have any trouble hearing, though, please let us know. Uh, but thanks for joining the Adams County Historical Society preserves millions of historic items in Gettysburg and that pertain to all eras of our local history. We tell the stories of the citizens of the community and their ordeal during events like the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, so tonight we're actually going to be going to some of the their final resting places of some of the more famous residents here in Adams County. And we have historian Tim Smith with, with us who's going to be talking about their stories, their legacies, and uh, more broadly, the history of Evergreen Cemetery. Um, so I want to give a shout out to Maria Lynn, our collections manager behind the camera tonight. And again, we'll try to watch the comments. So if you do have questions throughout the broadcast, please let us know. Uh, we'll be sure to, to direct them to Tim. And uh, we may even stop at some of your ancestors' uh, graves. If you, you have ancestors buried here and we can easily um, stop and, and see their grave, we may be able to, to do that. I um, also want to give a quick shout out to the Dobbin House Tavern. Uh, which has sponsored all of our annual programs this year. And then finally, uh, I hope you'll continue to support the Adams County Historical Society's capital campaign to build a new museum and a new headquarters for our incredible collection. Um, and uh, we will make sure that there's a link posted in the comments to uh, enable you to visit our website and donate. Uh, but without any further ado, I think I will turn it over to my good friend, our historian, Tim Smith, who's also the president of the Evergreen Cemetery Association. So Tim is going to walk us through the cemetery this evening. Thanks. So tonight we're going to be talking a little bit about Evergreen Cemetery and uh, uh, some of the people buried here. Uh, I'm not going to get into extreme detail on the history of the cemetery, and I'm not going to show all the graves of the people I would like to talk about. So if you have an interest in Evergreen, we recommend that you read the book Beyond the Gatehouse by the superintendent of the cemetery, Brian Kennel. And this is available on the Adams County Historical Society uh, website in our bookstore. So you might think about that. It has lots of great stories and a good general history. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the area, we are on Cemetery Hill, just south of the town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And of course, Cemetery Hill is where the Northern Army rallied on the evening of the first day of the fighting. And on the second and third day of the fighting, Cemetery Hill was the anchor of the Union battle line. And the Union line basically stretched from Culp's Hill, which is out behind me, around the Cemetery Hill, Hill and down to Little and Big Round Top. And on top of Cemetery Hill, you get a good view of the area that surrounds it. There were actually troops positioned in the cemetery during the fighting. Tombstones were damaged during the battle. Uh, I should mention that the Evergreen Cemetery was established in 1854, and the first burials were in November of that year. So it was about nine years old at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. And today, there are some 15,000 people buried in Evergreen Cemetery. Uh, at the time of the battle, there were about 500. We have about 400 burial permits. Uh, and then, of course, there were people that had been moved in here and uh, the burial permits didn't start right away. I think not until 1856. So let's say there were about 500 people buried in the cemetery at the time of the battle. Um, of course, the Evergreen Cemetery Gatehouse is, uh, was built in 1855, a year after the cemetery was established. And the first caretaker was Peter Thorne. And in 1863, Peter Thorne joined, I think they're coming here. Peter Thorne joined the Union Army. And uh, uh, he was not here at the time of the battle. And his wife, Elizabeth, was actually the caretaker of the cemetery. And following the battle, uh, she, her father, and uh, a couple of helpers she managed to get for a short time buried over 90 soldiers in the cemetery. And of course, she was pregnant at the time. 
So um, quite an ordeal she went through. Now, one, there's a couple stories that are associated with the cemetery that are pretty well known. And I'd say one of the more famous stories that got a lot of attention in the years after the Civil War, um, uh, it was actually the earliest mention I could find of it I, uh, in a written source is in 1866. It's told in the photographic um, scrapbook of Alexander Gardner. And basically the story goes like this. The original cemetery was a very handsome enclosure and contained many elegant monuments, very few of which were injured, notwithstanding the terrible nature of the conflict. The shrubbery was badly broken and the fences swept away. But at the conclusion of the fight, there still remained, as if in mockery, the notice, all persons found using firearms in these grounds will be prosecuted with the utmost rigor of the law. The shattered trees and crushed flowers have all been replaced by others whose beauty and fragrance we may confidently hope shall never be again blasted by war. Colonel Edward Solomon of the 82nd Illinois um, also gave a colorful version of this story in a speech that he gave in 1912. He mentioned that while he was in the cemetery on July 2nd, he called General Oliver Otis Howard's attention to that same sign. Driving, riding, and shooting on these grounds strictly prohibited. Any persons violating the ordinance will be punished by fine and imprisonment. I told the general that he was surely getting into trouble after the battle for violating this order. While the general was reading it, a shell struck the board and knocked it into a thousand pieces. Well, said the general, the ordinance is rescinded. I think the shooting can go on. Always like in the middle of a battle where men are dying and shells are flying, we have time for a little bit of humor. I, I think that's a, that's a great story. Now, we don't really have any evidence that such a sign existed, but this story is in many books, and it's one of the more popular stories associated with our cemetery. Now, um, now we're going to walk through the cemetery, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the people buried here. Um, the cemetery... The cemetery was laid out uh, shortly after it was established. And one thing's interesting in our cemetery is that family plots were sold. It's the first non-denominational cemetery in the area, meaning it's not associated with one particular church. And so the families in the town purchased plots in the cemetery in various locations. So where a cemetery you know, you might have like plots at the beginning and the oldest stones at the beginning, and then they get more recent as, uh, you know, go back through the cemetery. Our cemetery, since it had family plots and the families chose their plots all across the top of the hill, some of the oldest stones are in the back and there's some old stones in the front. And also, after the cemetery was established, other people were removed from cemeteries and other places and their bodies were placed in the family plots alongside the people that died after the cemetery was established. So we're going to see that we have a lot of older stones. And that brings us to our first resident I want to talk about here. And that is James Geddes, the founder of our town. And you might notice that James Geddes died in March of 1815. His wife died a few days later, and I believe his mother also died about the same time. Apparently a fever was going through the town, uh, and it's mentioned uh, in one of their um, death notices. Uh, James Geddes was originally buried in the Upper Marsh Creek Presbyterian Cemetery, which still exists out on uh, Belmont Road near the Mummersburg Road. And in 1865, his son, who had moved to Tennessee, came back to Gettysburg and moved his father and mother's remains, his brother's remains, um, kind of uh, uh, one of his cousins who kind of was his adopted sister, who was moved into the cemetery. So the Geddes family was moved here later, and this large memorial was placed on their grave. One of the more interesting stories associated with this 
is there's a slab in front of the stone. And originally, there was a cast iron greyhound dog at this site. But the cast iron dog was stolen from our cemetery many years ago. And um, you can see where it used to be here on the slab. Uh, a local story told by early tour guides um, was that James Geddes uh, was a great collector of dogs. And when the borough was incorporated in 1806, uh, one of the first rules they passed was a tax on dogs. And James Geddes, who had owned the town for many years and wasn't really used to taking orders from a town council, was unhappy. And he had a collar made for his dogs. And the collar said, hi, I am James Geddes's dog. Whose dog are you? <laughs> and of course, the story is that this cast iron greyhound dog had that collar on. But of course, we don't have a close up or a photograph it to conf uh, of it to confirm that. I personally like to point out the grave back there, and it's Robert Geddes. This is um, uh, James Geddes' son, who died, I believe, in 1827. We can walk back if you like. And uh, it says on it, there's a poem on the grave. And the poem says, and you don't have to see it particularly, remember me as you pass by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so shalt thou be. Prepare for death and follow me. There's a second verse, but I think you get the gist of it. What's interesting about that is this is not unique, this poem. It appears in cemeteries all over the northeastern United States. Um, it appears apparently in cemeteries in Europe. I read an article about it in Reader's Digest about how prevalent this inscription by an unknown poet is on stones. And I think I have seen it like 10 times in different stones in different Adams County cemeteries. And usually when we do a cemetery tour, I find a stone with that inscription. According to the article in Reader's Digest, when you see that inscription on a stone, you are supposed, supposed to repeat back to it, to follow you, I am not content until I find out which way you went. What is the name of James Getty's dog? Cool. <laughs> do we, know? we do not know the name of James <laughs> Geddes' dog. Good. Let's walk over here. When I walk through the cemetery, I can't help but notice all the local Adams County names like Shriver or Spangler or Bushman or Weikert. Let's walk over here to the Weikert plot. When we did our program on Jenny Wade last week, we got a lot of attention and questions about the Trinity Reformed Cemetery. I mentioned that is one of the cemeteries that used to be in downtown Gettysburg. But after they opened Evergreen, you know, they slowly removed the stones and the bodies out of those other cemeteries into Evergreen. And in 1927, whichever stones were left, there was a mass removal to the cemetery uh, from Trinity. And these three stones here in the Weikert plot were originally in Trinity Reformed Church Cemetery. And look at this one, John Weikert, who died, I believe, in uh, 1839. And it says, stop, passengers, as you pass by, as, I am, as you are now, so once was I, as I am now, so you may be, prepare for death and follow me. Just to show you that there's another... Uh, stone like that just here not far from the original let's walk back here while well, you're walking just want to thank the american battlefield trust our good friends for sharing the the feed tonight and happy to have all of you with us so the cemetery had its grand opening on november 7th 1854 and this is a copy obviously of the 
um, program for the opening of the cemetery, the dedication ceremonies. And this is in the collections of the Adams County Historical Society. So November 7th, and this is Mary Beitler, who died on October 29th, 1854, wife of Daniel Beitler, age 75. Her funeral was on November 1st, and this is the first person buried in Evergreen Cemetery. Now, having said that, there's a lot of stones in here that uh, predate 1854. Uh, there are, are a few stones from the 1760s in the cemetery. So there are stones from people that were buried at other locations, and they were later moved into the cemetery, into the family plots, after the cemetery was established. Also, I just want to show this photograph from 1867. And you can see that many of the family plots had fences around them or shrubbery around them. The cemetery had an altogether different appearance at the time than it does now. I think in 1875, they decided that no longer would they allow fences to be placed around plots. And slowly, over the years from that point, they removed the fences. And now you can see that the family pots are all just kind of connected together, but they still, you know, they're still laid out in these plots. So let's walk in this direction. And we're going to keep you moving. And like I said, as you walk through the cemetery, you can't help but notice um, uh, lots of familiar names from our county. We just passed uh, some of the Bushmans and Spanglers. Hullaball. I'm going to get away from the And sign. please feel free to give us your questions. We're watching carefully, so if you have any questions, just put them in the comments, and we'll make sure that uh, Tim gets them. <laughs> of course, being a licensed battlefield guide, I like to point out the graves of battlefield tour guides. And here is the grave of Luther Minig, who was 14 years old at the time of the battle. His brother was Henry Minig, the captain of Company K, 1st Pennsylvania Reserves. And he was a, a boy at the time who was in his basement during the fighting on West Middle Street. And later, he became a prominent tour guide, and he wrote an uh, early tour book, which is, you know, you can buy this around town in the flea markets, and the Adams County Historical Society must have like 10 copies of it. Of course, he's very proud, and um, he's one of the more prominent tour guides, and he has his photograph on the, or his, you know, engraving here on the front of his book. Let's walk up in this direction now. John Herbst, who uh, had a farm on the first day's battlefield. And of course, he was married twice. I don't know a lot of people realize his first wife, Suzanne, died in September 1863 of sort of disease from the battle. Can you imagine the conditions after the fighting and how horrible it was? And it was a lot of uh, bad water in the wells and, and she got sick and died. Now, also, I want to mention Sarah J. Hoffman, or Sadie Hoffman, and she uh, left an account of the battle. You can see she lived until uh, 1938, and her account, she's the one that describes that every person in town was issued a bottle of peppermint oil, which they, which they hung on a chain around their neck, and they had a rag, and they would dump peppermint oil in the rag and hold it over their face to deaden their sense of smell. So as you walk through here, not only do we have local Adams County residents, but 
you know, since at the historical society we deal with the battle and the farmers who lived on the fields around the town, most of the farmers are buried in this area that are prominent from the Battle of Gettysburg. And now, of course, we're going to walk up to a section in our cemetery where something happened that really made this place famous, maybe more than the battle. Let's walk out. Tim, are there any Confederate soldiers buried in this cemetery? There are at least two Confederate soldiers known to be buried in this cemetery, and they are in the soldier section. And they were moved into the cemetery after the Civil War from a hospital site south of the town and they were placed in the soldier section. It's interesting that after they were buried here, local citizens came to a cemetery board meeting and demanded that the soldiers be removed. And so the two soldiers were buried in an undisclosed location within the cemetery grounds. And today, we argue about where that might be. Now, there are two other Confederate soldiers off the top of my head buried here also, and of course, that's post-war, well, theoretically. One of them is a guy um, who, uh, Milas Wilson, who was in the, um, was in Scales Brigade, and after the first day's fighting, he went to a local farm, and he hid out at that farm, he went AWOL from his unit, and he just stayed in Gettysburg after the battle. And then, of course, theoretically, you know, Wesley Culp may be buried here. That's what people say, but we don't know that for sure. Okay go up here. Tim, just uh, off the top of your head, if we're walking by, we've got people asking to see the McConaughey's, the Trossels, and uh, Alan Frazier, which I'm sure you're probably already wow. planning to stop okay. at. <laughs> yeah. Tim does know every family plot in the cemetery by heart, right, Tim? Oh, sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> McConaughey might be a little hard to get to. Oh, here's just flash down here. Jay Luvas. So not only do we have... Um, you know, older battlefield guides, but he is a, a newer historian and wrote a tour book of the battlefield for uh, the War College that some of our tour guys are very familiar with. Let's go through here. Tim, who is the most famous citizen buried in Evergreen Cemetery? That's probably the debatable. most famous person buried in Evergreen Cemetery, without a doubt. <laughs> is Mary Ann Moore, because she's a poet, and she's the only person buried in our cemetery with their own postage stamp. There you go. I'm sure Eddie How Plank can is, you argue about that? Eddie Plank, a close second. He doesn't get a postage stamp, yeah. <laughs> of course, I would say Jenny Wade, John Burns, or Eddie Plank. Here is the grave of Israel Yount. At the time of the Civil War, Israel Yount owned the Washington House Hotel, which is the current site of the Lincoln Diner on Carlisle Street. And after the battle, his hotel was used as a hospital. Here's an advertisement of the hotel with the earliest photograph we have that gives an idea of the appearance of the hotel. But it was right around this site where the platform was positioned during Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. So the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery, obviously, um, the cemetery is right here. The platform is pretty long and pretty wide. So it went across through this area. And of course, you know, we argue about the exact site of the platform, but we're right in the area of the platform, and Lincoln stood on the platform and spoke to a crowd of spectators four months after the battle that stood out in that direction. And, um, uh, do you have the? No. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> we were so going at, to. <laughs> at the Adams County Historical Society, you might know that we have an actual program from the ceremonies of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, the dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery. But uh, let's walk over here now. Is 
Does Tim have a plot waiting for him at Evergreen? <laughs> I do have a plot in Evergreen Cemetery. You can't be on the board of Evergreen Cemetery if you don't have a plot in the cemetery. <laughs> I wanted to walk over here first. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm walking in circles for you. Right here. This wasn't one that I planned to show, but here we are. Mary Thompson, the widow whose house was used by Robert E. Lee as his headquarters during the battle. And let's walk over here. You'll notice Jenny Wade in the distance. I'm sure Tim has a, a plan to visit Jenny. <laughs> I do not. Really? <laughs> we visited Jenny Wade last week in our That's program. Right. That's why I wasn't thinking about it. Here is Solomon Powers who was born in um, uh, New Hampshire. He was a stonecutter. Uh, he lived on High Street at the time of the battle. And he lived there with his wife and six daughters. And his daughters cared for wounded soldiers after the battle. They went outside their house. They gathered up um, uh, wounded soldiers and nursed them back to health. And it was the women of Gettysburg who nursed the wounded soldiers, who baked bread for the hungry soldiers, who um, buried the dead after the fighting. And Elizabeth Thorne's statue that's erected in this cemetery is in honor, not just of her, but all the women of Gettysburg who sacrificed during this critical time in our country's history. But Solomon Powers, um, you know, the Adams County Historical Society has this incredible photograph of him. Um, uh, there was a boy living with Solomon Powers at the time of the battle. His name was Alan Frazier. And you might notice there's a brand new stone for Alan Frazier. And I should mention that this stone was uh, placed here uh, by the um, Gettysburg Civil War Roundtable. So we have to have a shout out for the roundtable and their good work. He did not have a stone, but we do have a burial permit for him, and he is buried in this plot. According to the Gettysburg Compiler of November 23rd, 1863, terrible accident. Mr. Russell Briggs of Philadelphia, who came here to remove the remains of his son killed in the battle, and at the same time witnessed the ceremonies of Thursday, the Gettysburg Address, met with a terrible accident on Friday, November 20th, at the residence of Mr. Solomon Powers. It seems that he had picked up a shell on the battlefield and undertook to unload it. He had the cap taken out and was striking the shell upon a stone to loosen the powder and thus attract the balls when the missile exploded with a loud report and so horribly mangled his hands as to require immediate amputation of both. While the shell bursted, Alan Frazier, an interesting lad of 14, son of T.L. Frazier, deceased but living with Mr. Powers, was standing near Mr. Briggs when it exploded. And a fragment, striking him in the abdomen, cut him nearly in two, causing his death in a few minutes. His remains were interred on Saturday in Evergreen Cemetery. Another warning, and one of the saddest, that the dangerous business of shells opening has yet afforded. May it be the last. And here's the burial permit for Alan Frazier. And you might notice that it says, um, disease, killed by the explosion of a shell. And it gives his location as being at this site. So that's how we knew where to put the stone. Now I should mention, that the Adams County Historical Society has an original copy of the post-war burial permits for Evergreen Cemetery. And I hope that this particular thing will be on display when we get our new uh, museum gallery design. But it's fascinating. Let's continue on. Oh, we're going this way. Tim, how many uh, citizens of the town were injured or killed by unexploded ordnance like Alan Frazier? I would say it depends how you count, because some of the people who were injured by unexploded ordnance after the battle are not um, 
living in the town, like there's a child in Fairfield and there's a guy from York that's injured. But I would say that I can think off the top of my head at least six or eight. And, uh, uh, you know, it was a serious issue after the battle. Loaded weapons lying around on the battlefield, shells. And we're going to talk about another explosion coming up here soon. So let's walk this way. And thank you to Timothy York, who says this is the best ACHS presentation to date. <laughs> <laughs> Timothy York might be a friend of mine. <laughs> so here is the grave of Frederick Huber. And this is kind of sad. He is the son of a doctor who lived on Chambersburg Street at the time of the battle. And he was actually in Philadelphia to outbreak of the war, and he joined the 23rd Pennsylvania Infantry, the Kalas Zouavs. And at the Battle of Fair Oaks in 1862, um, Frederick Huber was killed. And his remains were brought back to Gettysburg. He was buried in this grave. And during the Battle of Gettysburg, an artillery shell hit his stone and damaged his stone. And his father made sure the stone was never repaired. So it's one of the, you know, we, we argue about exactly how many, you know, three or four stones in our cemetery that absolutely still show battle damage from the fighting in July 1863. Obviously many of those stones that were damaged were replaced afterwards. Let's head this way. Tim, are there any other famous soldiers buried in the cemetery off the top of your head? I guess famous, famous soldiers. Hard to well, you know, qualify. we have a soldier from the Battle of Shiloh. A guy who mortally wounded to battle Shiloh buried here. We got a guy up there that died in a hospital at um, Nashville, Tennessee. And, of course, we have uh, Jenny Way's boyfriend, Jack Skelly, buried just a short distance over there. So we have local Adams County soldiers that are buried here. Um, so I would say yes. But, uh, again, it depends on how you look at it. This guy here. John McFarland in 1833 built the house that today we call the Farnsworth House. And um, right over here, I just wanted to point out, we're going this way anyway. Um, here's a troxel. There you go. So um, I think they wanted trossel. Trossel. They want trossels. Okay. This Close is the troxel. Okay. 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 You can't see this one very well, but this is John Houck. He owned Devil's Den at the time of the battle. John Houck. Tim showed a picture earlier of Solomon Powers, and we have hundreds, maybe even over a thousand images of the people of Gettysburg and Adams County, uh, many of which were taken at the time of the Civil War. One of my favorite people. John E. Pitzer, who lived at, um, I'm thinking the address today is uh, 143 Chambersburg Street, but he lived on the Pitzer farm at the time of the battle behind um, the North Carolina Monument. So if you go on the Confederate Avenue to the North Carolina Monument, there's a big old farm back here, the Pitzer farm. And uh, John Pitzer uh, served as a veteran in the Civil War. I believe off the top of my head he was in the 165th Pennsylvania Infantry. But um, after the war, he was another of those who served as tour guides. And this, check out this awesome picture of John Pitzer. Uh, he by far wasn't licensed, but Battlefield Tour Guide. <laughs> and um, here is an advertisement for the Pitzer House. Like I say, today I'm pretty sure it's 143 Chambersburg Street but boarding and lodging, the only temperance house. Look, they even have warm and cold baths. And here, of course, teams and guides to all the principal points of interest on the battlefield, including a good substantial dinner, a dollar 25 for a whole day's tour with a dinner. Wow. I think that's a good deal. Right. But I just, I mean, I just love that photograph of John Pitzer. Let's go this way.
Someone's pointing out that the cemetery is beautifully maintained, and kudos to Brian Kennel. We should thank Brian. Yeah. Our superintendent is just awesome. I don't know if I know, very, there's very few people I know that are so good at their job and are a command of every detail of their job. And, you know, I challenge you to find a better, well-maintained cemetery than this. He does an awesome job. And, uh, uh, of course, his father was a superintendent of this cemetery prior to him being superintendent. And so he learned from his father, and he's been here for many, many years. And like the Thorns, he still lives in the gatehouse. Yeah, just like the, the Thorn family did at the time of the battle, he lives in the gatehouse. Right. Now, this is the Sheeds family plot. And there are a number of Sheeds families in Gettysburg. But, of course, the one that gets the most attention is the family of Elias Sheeds. And if we walk right over here, you'll see... Here's Elias Seeds, and Elias Seeds has four sons and three daughters. Of course, the most famous of which is back there, Carrie Sheeds. Carrie Sheeds uh, ran a private uh, girl's school out of her father's house. Um, all four of Carrie's brothers served in the Civil War, and all four of her brothers died as a result of their service. James um, died in a hospital at City Point in 1864. Elias was killed in the Battle of Monocacy. And it says that right on the stone. Um, uh, David, uh, he suffered horribly during the war and died a few years afterwards in 1874. And um, uh, Robert Cheech back there died after the war, but of his wounds received at White Oak Swamp. Their sister Louisa um, died in 1866, I believe, and she, it, um, it might be 65, it's kind of hard to read, I think it's 65. She died, uh, according to the family, of a chloroform overdose. We've never been able to prove that, but she was nursing soldiers in Washington, D.C. And uh, Carrie and Elizabeth, because of their uh, family sacrifice were actually given jobs in the Treasury Department and the War Department in Washington, D.C. They had a niece that was a daughter, I believe, of um, Robert, Mary, and she died in 1934. None of the girls married. And so basically, this large family ended because of the tragedy of the American Civil War. And you might see that they have very patriotic stones, and it has that Latin inscription on the base of the stone. Um, I, and believe me, I don't know much Latin. Something like, uh, it translates something like, there is no sweeter death than for one's country, something like that. And uh, Maria, who's behind the camera, she was instrumental in getting the Historical Society a donation just about a month ago. And that donation included the only known photograph of Carrie Sheeds, which a lot of Gettysburg aficionados were very, very excited about. And so we posted it. And um, this is her uh, from a Washington, D.C. studio about a year or two prior to her death. And off the top of my head, 1884. It's 1884 she dies. So... Um, Along with that, we also received some other photographs I'm going to talk about in a moment. But let's walk over here. This is the Daniel Culp family plot. And, you know, I know it's nice that at some point they took all the old you know, uh, stones away, and they put these nice new stones here at this spot. We have a few photographs of, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head exactly when this occurred, but they replaced all the stones. I wonder what they did with the original stones. I tend to like the old, hard-to-read, beat-up stones, not the, the new replacement stones. But one of uh, Daniel Culp's sons, is James Culp, who died in his 17th year. And uh, here's the burial permit for James M. Culp. 
and you might see 16 years, 10 months, 22 days in the 17th year, disease killed by the explosion of a shell on September 9th, 1863. And according to the article in the newspaper, it was just on the other side of the cemetery at the base of East Cemetery Hill where James M. Culp was trying to get the uh, fuse out of an explosive shell so he could bang it against a rock and get the fuse, the, get the powder out. The shell exploded and he was killed. And of course he's buried here. So there we point out two people that we know of in our cemetery that were killed accidentally after the battle because of explosive shells. And uh, let's walk over here. We have a ton of information about the people buried here in front of us. And if we go to the Daniel Culp family, uh, the Culp family back there, the Sheeds family, the Culp family over here. Um, I was telling uh, Andrew earlier, I think I can come up with in this area photographs for more than half of these people, probably about 20 photographs for this small plot. So let's let's look right, right here. Here is Jeremiah Culp, who lived on York Street at the time of the battle. And we also, this is uh, from a daguerreotype in uh, our collection at the Adams County Historical Society. We also have a daguerreotype of his wife and photographs of many of his children. And um, I wanted to point out this one in particular, Andrew. This is, I don't know if you can read it, J. Mead Culp. And Jeremiah Mead Culp was born on July 4th, 1863. And he died in August of 1863. So that's why you don't hear much about him. But undoubtedly, he is one of the battle babies. Now let's walk back here for a moment. And we have, you know, all these photographs at the Adams County Historical Society, and we're excited to be displaying those at our new building that we're working on right now. We're actually going to have a wall of faces of all the citizens of the town who witnessed these events in 1863. And we have photographs that date back, as Tim said, to glass plate images, the daguerreotypes and ambrotypes. We also have tintypes and CDVs or cartes de visites uh, from the uh, Civil War period. So all these images collectively, uh, we're excited to, to show those so that you can actually look right into the eyes of the people who, who saw all these incredible events. So here is John Jefferson Myers. And he's buried right here. And he was a member of the 87th Pennsylvania, I believe. Um, and he actually left the unit. Uh, uh, he had uh, some illness. And so at the time of the battle, he was living on Middle Street in Gettysburg. In the spring of 1863, J. Jefferson Myers, Sally Myers' brother, married Wesley Culp's sister. And here is Anna Culp, Wesley's sister. Of course, Wesley Culp being the guy the, who was raised in Gettysburg, then moved to Virginia prior to the outbreak of the war, joined the 2nd Virginia Infantry as a, of the Stonewall Brigade, returned to Gettysburg as part of the Confederate Army, and was killed in the fighting somewhere east of town, probably on July 2nd, 1863. Not far from the hill named after his great-grandfather. Probably killed on Brinkerhoff Ridge, though. This is his sister, Anna Culp Myers. And there she is, right there. And uh, it was her house on e uh, West Middle Street that Wesley Culp visited on the evening of July 1st and told her that she had a message for Mrs. Skelly because her son... Um, Johnston Hays, you know, Jack Skelly, Johnston Hasing Skelly Jr. was wounded at the Battle of Winchester. And of course, some say that she had uh, partly a message for Jenny Wade. I, I don't know if I believe that. But here are Wesley Culp's and Anna Culp's parents. Um, here is Margaret Culp, and she died in 1856. And then after that, Wesley moved to Virginia. His father, Esaias Culp died in 1861, and uh, here's an image of him, and 
His stone was struck by an artillery shell during the fighting. And at some point, a marker was placed on the stone to indicate that fact. So this is actually the grave of Wesley Culp's father. And um, in that collection we mentioned that we received with the Kerry Sheets photograph, it came from a Culp family member. We have this image that we believe is Esaias Culp and uh, Margaret uh, Sutherland, I believe her uh, maiden name is Culp. So there we believe are Wesley Culp's parents, and we believe this to be a daguerreotype of a younger sister of Wesley Culp that died, and we believe this is one of those mortuary images that were recorded early on, a daguerreotype. Fascinating stuff. Now let's walk back here. This is William Culp. This is Wesley and Anna's brother, and he is buried right here. Sometimes lost in the story of Jenny Wade is the fact that William Culp was a member of Company F, 87th Pennsylvania Infantry, and at the Battle of Winchester on June 15, 1863, William Culp and his brother Wesley fought against each other. As a matter of fact, the two, unit, the two units met each other on the field of battle and fired into each other. Wesley survived the battle. Of course, Jack Skelly was mortally wounded and died in the fighting. But brother against brother. And also, part of that group of photographs we were just discussing, we received images of Salome Sheeds Culp, the wife of William Culp. And this is about an 1862 photograph with one of her children and her two sons on either side. And this is Lauren Culp, who is buried, who's buried right there. There's Lauren Culp. And also, if we walk right out here for a moment. Here is one of my favorite all-time Gettysburg names, Wilbertus Culp. <laughs> And you can see that his nickname is Birdie, so Will Birdis. And here, in this image, the little child, Anna, is buried, oh, is buried here. And you can see she dies on September 12, 1863. One other grave we want to point out over here uh, is the grave of George Culp. He died in 1874. He was 74 years old. Uh, George Culp lived out on the Fairfield Road west of Gettysburg and at the Adams County Historical Society. We actually have this incredible handwritten note in pencil kind of scribbled onto a piece of paper and left in the house of George Culp by the Confederates. It says, Mr. Culp, your house was torn up pretty bad, but we'll do it a good deal more next summer if you don't quit burning up our houses and turning our women and children out of doors. And at the end it says, when this you see, remember the 9th Regiment of Alabama Volunteers. So George Culp had his house ransacked by the Confederates probably on the night of July 1st or on July 2nd by this kind of roving band of, of Alabama soldiers that was going around behind the Confederate lines. It's a great story, a wonderful artifact we're going to have in our new museum. Yep. Very good. I am so excited about that, that note. And back here, I just wanted to point out, for uh, those of you, of course, who are interested in the story of the Adams County Historical Society, you might notice that we have a huge amount of items from Sally Myers Stort, who nursed the soldiers after the battle in her home, in the Roman Catholic Church on West High Street, and then later at Camp Letterman. And we have just a wonderful collection of letters. We have her passes that she used to get out to the hospital. And we have stuff associated with the care of the wounded, including photographs of some of the people that she had cared for, and including a, a two guys that died um, uh, under her care. And her son was Henry Stort. And Henry Stort, who's buried right back there, of course, is uh, more famous for being the number one employee of the Adams County Historical Society during our tenure at the courthouse. 
And every day at work, I run across something that Henry Stewart put together at our society, uh, a finding guide or something that helps me locate information on local citizens. Okay. We should note our, our previous director, uh, Charles Glatfelter, who was director for 40 years, actually knew Henry Stewart when he was a young boy in Gettysburg. So it's amazing you know, that our good friend Charlie Glatfelter, who passed away a few years ago, knew the son of Sally Myers and, and uh, you know, the Civil War nurse. So in this section that we just walked around, we didn't cover much ground right here, but you can see that we have a large amount of information, and we didn't even get into all the different stories we have of the people that are buried here. But let's walk over in this direction. Sorry about that. Got some people in the cemetery this evening. They're wonderful evening to be out and looking at old headstones. <laughs> Tim, uh, do you know what year the kennels took over as superintendents of the cemetery? Someone's asking approximately. Great good. question. <laughs> It's, I'm going to say, I, uh, I, I don't remember off the time of my head, but it's in the 1970s. Art Kennel was uh, the caretaker of the Gettysburg Country Club. And I'm pretty sure he took the job in the 70s because um, Brian Kennel, who's exactly the same age as me, uh, lived down the bottom of the hill for a time. And I remember that uh, when he graduated from high school, he went to work here. And that would have been in 1981, so the 70s. So let's go this way. Great. Just a reminder, any other questions, just feel free to put them in the comments. We'll make sure we, we answer them as best we can. <laughs> the road system in the cemetery, Tim, is that something that's been around for quite some time? Now, the road system is the same system that we had originally, but there were actually paths between the roads from the different sections. So you'll see as we go along, I don't have a good example around me. Oh, over there is one. But there are paths within the historic plots so that you actually could walk down a road then get onto a side trail without entering a family plot and this was important because remember there were fences around each family plot and i should point out and let's just back up a little bit since somebody asked that question um here is one of the roads the the paths this is the roads are named on our cemetery map but this is one of the paths between lots. We have recently, cemeteries need to stay in business and they need to be current and vibrant. People now have the opportunity to buy a lot in what used to be one of the paths. So look over here. And you may notice that down here in this path is a grave of Jim Getty, who played Abraham Lincoln in our town functions for years and years and years. Of course, he has no relation to the local Gettys family. He was from Illinois, but I'm sure many of you knew Jim Getty. Another question about how the superintendents are hired. Is that a, a board decision? You know what? The cemeteries basically run the same today as it was run at its inception in the 1850s. And of course, the board of directors gets together and they hire the superintendent. But I wouldn't know anything about that because Brian and his father have been the superintendent of the cemetery for so many years, I don't <laughs> even know how that would work. Okay, let's go on. One of the earlier question was, are there any witness trees in Evergreen Cemetery? Hard to um, you know, I don't sure. think there are any witness trees in Evergreen Cemetery. We had large trees. The cemetery is very conscious of the fact that if a tree falls, it takes out a large amount of stones. So uh, if a tree uh, gets to the age where it has some issues, the tree is removed and replaced by another. So we don't have. But, of course, right over there, um, we're not too far from it, in the... Uh, National Cemetery is a honey locust along the fence, which is a witness tree. Wonderful. So probably, you can also see the Speaker's Rostrum in the National Cemetery over to our right. Many, many United States presidents and dignitaries and famous Americans have spoken from, from that platform. And, of course, that's where the annual celebration is to commemorate the Gettysburg Address anniversary, which I'm sure many of you have attended. <laughs> And, um, you know, we could go on and on and on. Of course, it's going to get dark soon. So I thought we'd end at the graves of Elizabeth and Peter Thorne. Peter Thorne 
Being a veteran of the Civil War was in Company B, 138th Pennsylvania Volunteers. And at the time of the battle, he was in Harper's Ferry with the rest of his unit. And Elizabeth Thorne was a caretaker of the cemetery. And of course, Elizabeth Thorne uh, leaves us an excellent account of the battle. And for this, if you're interested in it, you could find it on the internet, I'm sure. But you can always purchase Brian Kennel's book on Evergreen Cemetery, or there's a book on the story of Elizabeth Thorne by one of the Adams County um, volunteers, uh, Sue Boardman, who's actually um, a chairman of the, or not a chairman, but she's on the board of, of the Adams County Historical Society. So Sue's book is really good also. So you might want to check that out. But um, she talks about burying the dead in her account after the battle. And she says, well, you may know that my husband was in the army. My husband was in the army. My father was an aged man. Yet for all the foul air, we started uh, digging graves. I struck off the graves while my father finished one. I had another one started. This lasted for days until the boys sent word. If I couldn't get help at all, I should telegraph to some friends to come and help me. Two came, but only stayed for two days. They got deathly sick and left. The other stayed five days. He went away very sick, and I had to pay their fare here and very good wages for their work. By the time, by that time, we had 40 graves dug. And then Father and I had to dig on harder again. They kept on burying the soldiers until the, sol the National Cemetery was ready, and in that time, we had buried 105 soldiers. Uh, other accounts suggest it was 91, but I think when you get up to that many soldiers, you're probably not really uh, thinking about counting that well. Um, she also says that uh, in front of the house were 15 dead horses, and beside the cemetery there were 19 in that field. So you may know that it was the it was only excitement that helped me do all the work with all that stench, and. And three months after, I had a dear little baby, but it was not very strong. The child was named Rosa Mead Thorne. And of course, middle name was named just like Jeremiah Mead Culp, named after the Union Army Commander at Gettysburg. And sure enough, if you visit the cemetery, Rosa Mead Thorne died, I believe, at the age of 14, and I don't know if you can read it, Rosa Mead, right there. So, um, now there's lots of other people in the cemetery we could have pointed out, and lots of places we could have gone to. The sun is getting ready to set, so it's time to end our tour, and I'll let Andrew uh, finish it here. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. I can't believe there's 450 people almost watching this program tonight, which is incredible. We really appreciate your support. You know, the Adams County Historical Society is always in need of having new members and new supporters and new donors to help us preserve all this history. We are all about the stories that you heard tonight, the people who lived here, what their experiences were like. Uh, they're, they're incredible memories of things like the Battle of Gettysburg, of, of the Gettysburg Address, and, you know, of all eras of history. Of course, the Eisenhowers lived here later, and before the Civil War, we have a rich history as well. So, we are building a new facility. We need your help. If you enjoyed the program tonight, I hope you'll like our page. And also in the comments, we just posted a link to our website where you can make a donation. We really support it. Um, and we really appreciate your support. And uh, I hope you'll continue to watch our videos. One last question was, where uh, can you watch the other videos we've done? We do have a YouTube channel and we have every video we've ever done over the past year on that YouTube channel. So you can check that out and watch them to your heart's content. We also send out a, a weekly email with our, our program of the week. So if you subscribe to our website um, and our email list, you can get those as well. So thank you again for joining us. Thanks for being here in Evergreen Cemetery. And a shout out to Brian Kennel and the Kennel family for all the hard work they've done to keep the cemetery so beautiful. So thanks again and, and have a good night, everybody.